Here we go. Oh, Kiki, I'm sorry. <laughs> Scared the dog. <laughs> Kiki, it's okay. It's okay. On February 2020, the news dropped. Netflix signed a deal with six major manga and anime creators. Out of all these creators, one group in particular grabbed my attention for extremely selfish reasons that I had no right to make an entire video out of, but that's what you're getting anyway. The clam! Right? <laughs> Let's talk about clamp who they are, why they matter, how they might change the future of Netflix, and why I won't rest until they reveal what Sesho Maru said to Subaru in that one scene from X1999. <clears throat> ah, Clamp, the legendary Japanese all-female-led creator studio, developers of magical girl sagas extraordinaire, revolutionary sci-fi dramas, some questionable moe, and possibly, allegedly, allegedly, the originators of the infamous yaoi hands. That's right, I said it. Clamp, as a studio, is even known for building an interconnected multiverse that can almost rival Marvel's MCU. Okay, maybe not that, but it's pretty huge. So huge that there's no way I could possibly cover all the overlapping characters, storylines, themes, crossovers, and alternate universes in this video, but suffice to say, you can read the story of Sakura and Shoran in both the iconic card capture Sakura series or Tsubasa Reservoir Chronicles series. Hell, that particular multiverse deserves its own video. It's a multiverse within, within a multiverse multiverse. Perception, if you will. It may not seem too obvious if you've never been exposed to their work before, but Clamp's influence on anime media spans decades. They're the first group to create an AI Lolita with an on button on her on button. Yep, they can take credit for that one. They practically built the blueprint for that modern, dark-haired, be shonen aesthetic, and you can even thank them for that whole JoJo's Bizarre Adventure um Mpreg craze. Am I allowed to say Mpreg on this channel? <laughs> they have a child. It's born from an egg. It's a thing, okay? I spend way too much time on AO3. That's my roommate, she is helping me today because there's a snowstorm so we can't leave, so I'm recording at home. Welcome to Den O Cristal. Anyway, their influence overall in anime space seems subtle, but when you start to dig, they're everywhere. But let's go to the basics first. Clamp started as 11 art students making doujinshi or fan comics, with some members coming and going, the group eventually morphed into Clamp, the manga studio made by Nanase Okawa, Mokona Tsubaki, formerly Mik Nekoi, and Satsuki Igarashi. Currently, this four-woman studio ranks amongst the most successful creators of manga in Japan and the United States. What makes them different from other manga studios is how they do their projects. Their mode of operation is not very typical, but we'll get to that in a sec. Overall, once Clamp became official, they have created over 24 original works and have collaborated in over 14 works, including the character design and story for Blood Sea and the character designs for my favorite anime ever, Code Geass Lelouch of the Rebellion. So, above the unique way they operate, which again, I'll talk about more in a bit, what sets them apart? Clamp is one of the few creator groups that somehow appeal to both male and female readerships crossing both gender and genre lines with many, many series. They've somehow hit on a narrative formula where whatever they create, regardless of the medium, will be consumed by anyone. So they don't favor one audience over the other. I mentioned gender because manga and anime works in Japan happen to be divided this way. While Western comics or animation are categorized as action or sci sci-fi or romance regardless of their intended audience and maybe use some marketing cues like colors or design to signal that they'll appeal to a specific gender, in Japan, anime and manga are clearly designated in a per age group and per gender category. And it just so happens that in the current anime landscape, we are still very much divided when it comes to shoujo works, works intended for female audiences, versus the more popular and way more funded shonen genre, works intended for male audiences. And look, I like a good tournament. I'm a Food Wars and Saint Seiya stan. I'm all about the glory of battle, shameless fan service, and the hero's journey, or you know, Aaron Yeager's journey, whatever that is, where that may lead. But I'm also a fan of character-driven fantasy like Yona of the Dawn, or thought-provoking high-stakes historical dramas like The Rose of Versailles. And it's become harder and harder for creators in the anime industry to genuinely get the support they need to develop pieces outside of shonen. Not because shoujo is more limiting by itself, but because shoujo has been slowly narrowed in scope to equate nothing but romance, and that's a disservice to the genre as a whole. Luckily, Clamp sidesteps this. 
romance is rarely the focus, and when it is, it's ironically more prominent in their more battle-heavy shonen-leaning manga. They manage to avoid the trappings of both genres by refusing to be pigeonholed into either, and remaining steadfast to their wide-appealing stories with a shoujo aesthetic. And it might make sense for most artists and authors, whether male or female, to stick to the genre where they found success, but this is exactly what Clamp has never really done, because they've been successful in every genre so far. In fact, the group has serialized manga in magazines targeted to everyone from teenage girls to adult men. Audience, age, gender just never became a factor when it came to the types of stories that Clamp focused on creating. And the fact that it is a female group with a shoujo aesthetic with an origin as a slash doujin group is especially notable. Shoujo? Romance? BL? Jose? These are all considered secondary markets, and BL, or its old-fashioned term yaoi, and its cousin Slash, not the guitarist, at the time when Clamp was doing it was outright considered rotten or trash. It's where the word fujoshi, rotten women, came from. These were highly stigmatized genres. Stories or art that come out of female-lit spaces tend to have this backlash, and while shoujo as a genre doesn't suffer from outright backlash, it does get stifled by a lack of interest in developing it as seriously as shonen, and carries some pretty misogynistic assumptions about what the genre is. For example, we are currently in the midst of the isekai craze. Oh god, please stop already. <laughs> to the point where we reach redo of a healer levels of but why? And we consider isekai a typical shonen formula, but I grew up in Latin America, so I was exposed to early isekai titles that hadn't reached English-speaking shores yet. And my first exposure to isekai was actually within the shoujo genre. Escaflona, Magic Knight Ray Earth, and Fushigi Yugi are just a small sampling of shoujo isekai that defined a generation. But the scope for shoujo in recent years has become so narrow, we don't even have shoujo sports titles being promoted much anymore. And while I can't get into why that is right now, I will say it's one of the reasons I'm so excited about this upcoming Netflix collaboration with Clamp. Clamp is that rare studio that publishes a story in any magazine and somehow continues to find even wider audiences and experience their reach. Some people say it's because Clamp's works tend to maintain a high standard of artistic integrity no matter what, featuring complex characters and thematically rich stories filled with symbolism and illusion. And that's where the broad appeal is. Regardless of demographic, their stories are so tightly wound around sweeping human ethical battles and the struggle of good versus evil that it can genuinely appeal to anyone. In an interview with Kat Avila, Carol Fox, an editor for the now defunct Tokyo Pop, commented, Thematically, Clamp seems very fascinated with morality. Their characters are constantly wrestling with themselves over the right thing to do. Something to which pretty much all of us can relate. And the fact that so many of their stories deal with magical or fantastical elements adds a whole other layer to that. Characters are thrust into having magical powers and high stakes that they don't know how to handle. And there's often a great deal of dialogue about the ethical codes of magic and whether characters hold to these morals or disregard them entirely really tells you about the type of character you're dealing with. Clamp books tend to champion assertiveness bravery, and a firm grasp of reality while eschewing cynicism. Remembering the value of one's innocence and the simple joys of life is a common thread that runs throughout their series, and this makes most of their work just universal. As a viewer, you can basically jump on any clamp story and find yourself deeply invested before you know it, regardless of whatever genre you usually prefer. They are so gifted at establishing the human element that this crucial piece is rarely lacking, and at the heart of why their works have pioneered some of the most creative genre fusions in the industry. Magical girl mech isekai? Check. Sci-fi lowly existential slice of life seinen? Check. Buddy crime, suspense, paranormal shoujo murder romance? I mean, it's debatable, but... Check. <laughs> Horror, fantasy, action, sci-fi, psychological thriller. You, you get where I'm going with this. And I'm not even going to get into whatever XXXholic is. Step on me, Yuko, you're a queen. But what the f*** is going on? These unique genre combinations and their ability to transition seamlessly between audiences and also to create a continuous stream of work at a large scale, because boy, are they busy, let me tell ya, is one of the key characteristics of the studio, which makes sense when you think of how they run their operations. So let's get into that finally. The members of Clamp all share a single workplace 
and as such, do not need to arrange specific meetings. Now, Nanase Okawa may act as the group's de facto spokesperson, producer, director, and storyboarder, and Makona might be the chief character designer, but all four clamp creators often shuffle their roles. Sometimes they may split the work of the characters and backgrounds or have one person draw all the art depending on the story. The three artists in particular, Makona, Nikoi, and Igarashi, try to stay as close as possible to Okawa's original designs. Okawa advises the artist on what colors to use. Although Okawa chooses which projects they decide to decline or accept, Satsuki Igarashi decides on the actual time and order the group works on each project, creating the schedules for time allotted to each individual work. They do not have any assistance stating that assistance would slow them down because they would not understand the year's worth of jargon that they've created among themselves. Which, you know what? As a member of the bot crew, relatable. I'm not sure most people would understand what the heck we're talking about half the time in our private Discord. Dolphin. Once Okawa has conceived a story, the four members of the group gather to discuss the purpose of the story and its main characters. After the group members become familiar with the story, Okawa drafts an outline for the story and determines the story's setting. The ending for each story is predetermined. Okawa designs many of the characters early in the story's development, frequently appearing guest characters are designed from the beginning, whereas minor characters are designed early on, and as Okawa drops the outline, the other three members formulate character designs by creating character profile sheets so as to avoid confusion. After drawing a sample story and sketch for their editor and receiving approval, Okawa assigns the roles to each group member and then chooses the visual styles depending on factors such as the complexity of the story, the chosen art style, and its relationship to the group's other works. In fact, you can often find that a lot of the clamp works while they continue to share the clamp aesthetic do vary in the way that they use heavier or thinner line art etc and that has to do with the signature of each independent well individual artist within the clamp group it's it's a whole thing and yet they still look like clamp like you know. Okawa then provides a rough draft for each chapter, detailing things such as dialogue, panel size, props, movement, and characters' emotions. On average, for each chapter that they produce, which is about 20 pages of artwork in a magazine, storyboarding takes 12 hours. The script takes 8 hours to write, and the artwork, well, that depends on the story. A chapter of Holic takes 2 days, whereas a chapter of X1999 took 4 to 5 days. Sounds like madness? It works! and it allows them to create in a semi-isolated environment where their production output is unparalleled and their efforts become that unified clamp trademark style regardless of the art style they choose to represent. But even clamp, a powerful and proven team, is self-aware enough to recognize that as female creators, they're an exception. <laughs> even when some of the most popular manga like Inuyasha or Full Metal Alchemist have been written by women, because shonen is the dominant genre, you still find yourself coming up short when having to name more than maybe 10 female anime directors or auteurs at a time. And even with those who manage to break through, most female creators are still found in manga circles way more often than in anime circles. In an interview with the New York Times, Okawa said, while it's true that the the number of female directors in the animation industry has increased over the years, it's still more common for women artists to present their work in manga. It's a way for them to express themselves freely, and strong female characters have become very common in the medium. So it is noteworthy that Clamp rose to where they have with this impressive ability to operate the way they do and not stick to any specific genre or even office workflow that would make sense, but also appeal to a wide audience in any medium with a notably shoujo aesthetic and style. With its flowery frames, dewy, sparkly, wide-eyed protagonists, elongated bishonen designs, shoujo manga is still artistically marginalized. Luckily, that's been changing, and now the aesthetics of shoujo are being appreciated and accepted as part of what constitutes manga's visual style, but it took a while. With Shonen being the de facto leader, even the female artists that stood out did so because they essentially stuck to Shonen art style design conventions. Clamp and only a few other female creators chose not to sacrifice the shoujo aesthetic style while telling Shonen stories. And while this is a complex subject all on its own, basically Clamp is one of the key studios responsible for evolving the trend where Shonen became more be shonen friendly, aka pretty boy friendly. Back in the 80s, shonen was presented in a more hyper masculine sort of way, with titles like Dragon Ball, Fist of the North Star, City Hunter, Robotech. 
They presented these big, brawny, muscled hunks, and like, don't at me, but my Thundercats loving ass stand them too, okay? Like beefy shonen rights. Oh, hi Baki, not you. Anyway, marketing anime to girls and boys separately back then made more sense and had a more defined graphic style, but it also deeply limited both creators and audiences. Suddenly, Saint Seiya came out. <laughs> yes, it always comes back to Saint Seiya. And a strange phenomenon happened. The series itself was a violent super smash fest, but the boys were like, kind of pretty. And Clamp in particular started developing doujinshis for that series. Popularity soared. The fangirls had arrived. Me, I'm the fangirls. Suddenly, an equal amount of male and female audiences were invested in the Knights of the Zodiac, protecting their Athena, saving each other from freezing to death, or stripping naked in the ocean to wash off their impurities. Y'all know me by now, guys. Live and let horny. If nothing becomes popular in a vacuum, Clamp's influence is not necessarily the reason Saint Seiya became a breakout hit, but it is one of those great instances of fandom synergy and how it can drive industry evolution. Marketing for shonen has since become a lot more complex. It's like they discovered that girls have money and will spend it on the pretty. And the female audience is finally recognized as a primary market, though it's still in its early stages and we still have a long way to go in terms of how this audience gets catered to. Because again, a lot of what made shoujo exciting back back in the day has now been absorbed into shonen, and shoujo itself has been reduced to more of a strictly romance-driven genre. And look, I love romance, but just like the experience of being female, romance is not what defines the female gender or shoujo. The success of Clamp in both their native Japan and overseas across multiple audiences has allowed them more creative power, and that's what we want to see. So they're one of the few groups to push the boundaries of the art form. One excellent example is Chobits. Excellent and problematic. Okay, a seinen series that had a wide crossover appeal with shoujo audiences in particular. Helen McCarthy, the author of A Brief History of Manga, puts it best. Their manga Chobits is particularly important in the history of manga as it helped to spark two major trends. Seinen series meant to appeal to a female demographic, and MOA series about adorable, innocent girls being cared for by slightly older yet socially awkward men. That's right. It's women who are responsible for the Lolita Moa trend. <laughs> Yay us. <laughs> like, I'm not saying we're an enlightened consumer. <laughs> but thirsty fangirls might be more complex than the industry gives them credit for. Thus, here we stand with a much more diverse shonen landscape thanks to Clamp and a few problematic tropes too. Clamp also, just please stop with the grooming thing. It's it's the one thing I'm glad was edited out of Card Capture Sakura in the States. I'm not even gonna address that right now. But we've clearly regressed a bit when it comes to expectations of the shoujo genre or aesthetic and are in severe need of a reboot. Now, Clamp is signed with an exclusive deal with Netflix. What will that mean for the anime giant? Well, there's no way to predict the future, but I hope they dig their teeth into the shoujo genre and show us just how powerful it can be when it's set free. Now, I'd like to take an aside to get on my soapbox for just a minute and also propose something in lieu of this Netflix partnership, Bring Back X 1999. Finish it. What is X, you ask? Clamp's most notorious on hiatus work to date. Originally called X, and now X 1999, it's the story of the epic battle between the dragons of heaven and the dragons of earth in order to prevent the apocalypse of the year 2000. It was canceled because people were genuinely afraid of a real world apocalypse at the time. Even a single faulty unit could corrupt every other computer in the world. That can't be true, honey. If it were, I'd be terrified. Okay, maybe that was just one small factor. The real reason was that X-1999 depicted urban disaster at a time when Japan faced one of its worst earthquakes in history. The manga and the anime were fairly graphic, depicting violence and mayhem in the midst of Tokyo's ultimate destruction. So obviously that, that, that didn't land well. A very controversial, thought-provoking series that deserves to see the light of day again now that we're past the Y2K mania and are facing completely different global disasters, I mean. Again, Clamp is fascinated with sweeping moral tales that analyze human nature, but X-1999 in particular was adamant about its positioning of the Dragons of Heaven, which you are led to believe are the enemy, as the environmental group, while the narrative slowly took you into their cause and made you start feeling that maybe you were rooting for the bad guy. But what does that even mean? A healthy planet with no humans? A dead planet with humans? Would anyone survive? Would no one survive? 
survive. The moral and ethical undertones of that battle were explored intimately through multiple character arcs and perspectives, creating a debate that would still be pretty topical today. X-1999 also had an ensemble cast that included important crossovers from their early series, most notably Tokyo Babylon. So for those who were invested in the series, Finishing X-1999 didn't just mean wrapping up the story of Kamui, Fuma, and the Dragons of the Apocalypse, but also tying up the story of the Tokyo Babylon series as well. <laughs> what did Sashomaru say? What did it say? Look, those of us who are invested in this or traumatized, they know what they're doing. It's been 84 years, Clamp. Just tell us already. Netflix, this is your moment. This might be the thing that, you know, will allow me to ignore what you did with Knights of the Zodiac. Okay, maybe not. But this is how we start to heal. Anyway, whether they pick up X-1999 or not, one thing's for certain. Clamp as a creative team is not afraid to take risks. And I believe Clamp's involvement with Netflix has the potential to pioneer new and exciting anime trends on a scale that will continue to evolve and challenge the industry, especially the shoujo industry. What do you think about Clamp's yaoi hands getting all over your Netflix? What would you guys like to see from the studio? Would you like them to bring back Legal Drug? That is a series, not an actual substance. I really have hopes for X-1999 because they did release a trailer for the Tokyo Babylon reboot. X-1999 is a full-on sequel to Tokyo Babylon, so if they're doing that, might as well. Until next time, I'm Cristal Marie from Beyond the Bot, coming at you from the mess that is my living room in NYC because there's a legit snowstorm outside so I can't go bother you, do you? He also straight up kicked me out after the whole paprika debate on the podcast, so there. Get out of my home. I will live here now. It's horror. It is. Anyway, guys, this month we're going to have some exclusive content over on our Instagram, so be sure to check it out. We're making some IGTV originals and just generally uploading some fun stuff. Also, if you can, definitely sign up for our Patreon so you can get access to exclusive content Plus, you can ask us some embarrassing questions, such as... If you could be transported into any anime world, what would it be? Redo of... <laughs> no. <laughs> They're all bad. Every isekai kills you. Um, I'd like to be a client in Food Wars. So you want to be naked? <laughs> I mean, don't look at me like that! Speaking of Patreon and feeding me, um, this video wouldn't be possible without your support. So thank you so much to our patrons and a very special thank you to Half Priced, Andrew M, Critical225, Kyle, Eric Tortorapatu, and Sugar Joe. For real, y'all are powering this baby right now and helping the bot stay creator-led and independent. We love you. Thank you so much. See y'all next flight.